Hello, everyone, and welcome to the sixth episode of the Backdoor Plus podcast. Today, we're going to talk about e-commerce, specifically how publishers are now engaging with e-commerce and some of the things that you should think about in order to make that work. So let's just get to it and have a fun time. So e-commerce is one of these really big trends that we see a lot of publishers focusing on. And it's mostly centered around coming up with ways to add products to their sites and then monetizing that either via specific partnerships or via some form of affiliated revenue. Now, this is a really exciting trend, but it's also a trend that is hard to really do right. So let's focus on some of the bigger issues and tips that would be valuable for you to think about. The first thing I want to talk about is the problem of mixing journalism, the newsroom, and e-commerce into the same space. And obviously, there's a lot of concerned journalists out there who are worried about the role of journalism in the age of e-commerce. And it's great that many journalists feel this way, because you should be reluctant about the idea of mixing the two. As journalists, it's very important to be objective and trustworthy, and to shy away from being able to be bought by commercial partners. And on top of this, our audiences expect us to do this as well. When people come to a magazine, they expect something different than when they visit a brand. They expect to be advised based on whether the products are really good or bad, and they want honest feedback about whether a specific product is something they should be interested in or not. So as journalists, we can't put ourselves in a situation where we are paid to say something contrary to what we really think, or worse, contrary to the interests of our readers. And this is incredibly important. It's not just important for the sake of journalism. It's also important for why we exist and the role that we have for our audiences. The problem is that journalists often take this concept of objectivity to such an extreme that they become brand and product adversaries. In other words, they start to only think about brands as a negative. This is not good either, because the outcome of this is a very poor form of journalism in which journalists will either only talk negatively about brands or products, which is not very useful because that's not why people read our magazines. People come to us because they want our objective view about which products that are really worth focusing on. They want our help to pick something, not our rants about all the things that we don't like. The other thing journalists often do is that they focus so much on staying neutral that they end up disconnecting themselves from the articles they write. Now, this might be useful for things like covering politics, but if you're working for a magazine, you end up creating articles that has no passion and no value. Take something like a health magazine and imagine that you are writing a story about exercise bikes. Now imagine that you're writing about a new type of exercise bikes, but you're so focused on staying impartial that you just report the details and the specs. Because you're only looking at the specifics, there is no passion, no drive, or anything else in your voice. You're not giving people any advice, you're not contributing as to whether this product is good or bad, and you don't really have any insights to offer as a journalist. Think about how poor an article that really is. Because people don't just want to have the specs listed to them. They can read those on the manufacturer's website. They come to you because they want to listen to your advice your expertise, and to have you guide them to whether this is something that is worth looking into. In other words, the role that you have as a journalist is not to report, it's to influence. So we have these two factors. On one hand, it's very important that journalists stay fully objective. But on the other hand, you cannot become impassive. You have to bring your soul with you when you report about things. So Journalism and e-commerce can be opposite if you do it wrong. But if you do it right, they're actually part of the same thing. Because again, people want you to tell them what they should buy and what products are awesome. They want to hear that you are passionate about something or whether something is just boring and not worth paying any attention to. And they want you to act like you are an expert who can give them the best insights about why something is valuable or not. 
So the trick to getting e-commerce right is all about how you implement it and how you use it in an objective way. So let's talk about some of the specific things that you as a publisher should think about when you're creating your e-commerce strategy. And I'm going to highlight five different things here. The first important thing is that e-commerce is not a business strategy. It's an editorial strategy. You need to think about your e-commerce efforts as a direct extension of the editorial focus and editorial value. What I mean is that I see so many publishers make the same mistake in that they just think about e-commerce as an extra and just use that to add noise to their site. There are two examples that I would like to mention, and each of them are pretty bad. The first example is when a publisher is just adding a shop to their site. For instance, you might have a fitness magazine, and here it's very tempting to just add a section to your site called shop, where you're listing fitness-related products that your audience might be interested in. But instead of actually creating a real shop, this web shop that you have added is just a bunch of random links to products on Amazon. This is something we have seen many publishers do. And at first, it seems like a good idea because you have the traffic and a percentage of these are going to see the products and a few of them will click on a product link to Amazon and then a few of those will end up actually buying something. So compared to not doing anything, it kind of works because you are making more money from your affiliate links than if you weren't doing anything at all. The problem that I have with this is that it's such a wasted opportunity because you will be earning revenue from a percentage of a percentage of a percentage. In other words, you're getting the scraps. So if you have a publication where there is a natural link to shopping, like fitness, sports, interior design, or other magazines, don't just focus on creating an affiliated store. Create a real store. Don't just get a percentage of a percentage of a percentage. Get the whole thing. Create real partnership with brands. Put up a real shop that fits your audience. Or even better, Start making your own products. But this is a much better model because if you have a magazine where e-commerce is a natural fit, limiting yourself to just doing that as affiliated links to Amazon is kind of like doing it with the least amount of effort. If you have a natural fit, make the most of it. The second bad example I want to mention is another big mistake that I often see publishers do, which is that they separate their e-commerce efforts from everything else and they put up these e-commerce studios inside their companies where they assign a bunch of people to exclusively produce e-commerce focused articles for the site. The way this usually works is that a bunch of employees, usually separated from the real journalists, will go to Amazon every day and just find five to 10 products that might be relevant. And then they will write a 10 products that are great for runners or 15 pillows for your living room or other listicle type of articles. Again, the problem here is that this strategy seems to work if you're starting out from nothing because you're going from zero e-commerce revenue to some e-commerce revenue. But the problem also with these low-level listicle type of articles is that they're not very good at selling products. They have the lowest form of intent possible because they're not designed for people who really have a specific need. They're designed for people who are just bored and just happens to be clicking around on a random site. So we are talking about page views rather than e-commerce. And because of that, we get the lowest form of content possible and therefore also the lowest revenue potential. One of the key problems with these type of listicles is that they're not even a product review. The products that you often feature isn't something that you have ordered or tested, nor even something that you specifically liked. It's just whatever random product that you found that day on Amazon, and it shows. So publishers would put up these content studios and they would just push out these e-commerce focused articles. But what they don't realize is that they're creating the wrong type of audience with the wrong type of intent. And what happens is that this type of interaction then turns into more a form of advertising than a form of e-commerce. It has a very low overall value. And more to the point, it has a low revenue ceiling, which means that you might get an initial growth that looks really great, but you'll also very, very quickly reach the maximum amount of money that you can make from this because you just don't have any of the extra value needed to take this any further. So my advice to publishers is to not post articles just for the sake of showing five products from Amazon. That is not a very good strategy. 
Instead, focus on doing real reviews and do comprehensive testing of the products that you feature. And use that to build up a reputation where people come to you because they trust you and not just because they are bored and happen to click on a random link. But most of all, use your e-commerce efforts to help people achieve a goal. By doing this, you will have a slower initial growth because people have to discover the value you are creating for them. But you will have a higher growth potential in the long run and you will have a much higher value which can be used for many other things like membership growth or other subscription-like efforts. So e-commerce should have the same value, the same editorial focus as everything else that you do. It's not just an extra that you slap onto your site and it's not just something that you can have a content team write 10 articles about every single day. That is the lowest form of value. The second and very important thing I want to mention is that you cannot be paid to have an opinion. One of the biggest mistakes that you can make is to get paid to have an opinion about a product because there is nothing that's going to make you feel more shallow and more dishonest than that. If you are paid to have an opinion, that also means that whatever it is that you say is not real. So one of the most critical things that you must always remember is that if you are paid to feature a product, you can't do it as a review. You can't score it, you can't rank it, nor can you tell people whether you like it or not. Opinions and paid must never, ever be mixed. So the way to deal with this is to create a very visible difference between when you are talking about a product by your own and when it's part of a paid partnership. The best way I know for this is to look at how YouTubers are dealing with this. There are many YouTubers who do this wrong, but the established rule that many of the very good YouTubers follow is that if you are paid, you will start the video by saying, this is a paid sponsorship. Because of this, it's not a review and I won't be expressing my personal opinions about it. Instead, I will focus on just showing you what this product is about and just have some fun with it. That's it. You tell people that because you are paid, you can't express your opinion. And it's then up to people themselves to form their own opinions based on what they see, but you don't tell them what you think, nor do you rank the product. And this is incredibly important because if you get this wrong, if you are paid to feature a product or if you present your product in a paid way and you then express an opinion about it, you will appear incredibly dishonest and there is nothing worse that you can do neither as a publisher or as a journalist for your future reputation and the relationship that you have with your readers. This is particularly important if you want to do any form of membership or subscription as well as doing e-commerce. If you are doing e-commerce in a dishonest way in which you're expressing an opinion about a product that you're being paid for, nobody's going to subscribe to you because it's not a trustworthy way to interact with people. So it's incredibly important to have this mentality that if you're paid, you can't express an opinion. Now, obviously, when it comes to e-commerce and affiliate advertising, you can still talk about a product and you can still link to a product using your affiliate link, even if you're not paid for it. The affiliate link by itself does not mean that you are paid for it. It's just another form of revenue. So when I talk about paid here, I'm talking about actual brand partnerships where a brand is giving you money in order for you to talk about that product. If you take that and you mix it with e-commerce and then also you start to review it and express your opinions, that's where we have a problem. So always keep that in mind. The third thing that we need to talk about is that it's one thing to create good e-commerce content that is linked to your editorial strategy. But if you actually want to create a high level of revenue from that, one of the things that you must do is to focus on creating what we call purchase intent. Now, this is always a controversial topic because, again, journalists don't want to think about themselves as being someone who is selling content to their audiences. They think about themselves as journalists, as they should. But it doesn't change the fact that the best way to get an e-commerce outcome is if you create purchase intent. So as a publisher, you need to think about how can you create purchase intent through your editorial strategy. The answer to this obviously depends on what type of publication you have and it depends on what type of articles you create. But let me just give you one example. Imagine that you are publishing something like a sailing magazine. What you usually have is three types of stories. 
you will have reviews where you are specifically reviewing a product, which is a perfect fit for an affiliated link. Then you have experience or adventure type of articles where you're taking people on a journey. These articles are very interesting for people to read, but they're not a very good fit for e-commerce because they're not about any specific product and they're not really about buying something. It's about people having a good time. But then we also have the third type of articles where you have a more goal-oriented approach. And with a sailing magazine, this could be articles about how you are helping sailors do something or how they can fix something on their boats or how they can better do ricking of their sails or other things like that. It's this final category of articles that is the perfect fit for e-commerce because you are directly helping people do something. It's 100% per se intent oriented because the products that you use in order to solve people's problems is also the products that people want to buy. So think about your e-commerce strategy and your editorial strategy in relation to these different types of categories. You have reviews, which is generally a good fit for e-commerce, but only if you do them right. And you have adventure articles, which is not necessarily a good fit. And then you have the guides and the solutions and the how-to articles, which is just a perfect fit. In other words, if you want to strengthen your e-commerce efforts, it's this last category of articles that you should focus on because that's really where the big intent really is and where you as a journalist can come in as an expert and as an influencer and to help people achieve something. And through that, you can explore different products and you can help people pick out the right things to buy. So think about e-commerce in ways of purchase intent and think about in what type of situations can we create the best content possible while at the same time create the highest level of purchase intent. And that's where the intersection between editorial and e-commerce comes together and becomes a positive rather than just you trying to sell some random products. Then we come to the fourth thing that you should be focusing on, which is that you can't be a supermarket. What I mean by this is that most traditional publishers suffer from two very big problems. One is that their editorial focus is just to do a little bit of everything for everyone, which is a big problem because if you just a little bit for everyone, you don't really have a good way to present people with relevant products. And the other problem is that with many traditional publications, the role of a journalist is to be someone in the background that people don't really connect with. And we see this very clearly when we look at most traditional magazines. They're very good at producing a high number of articles, but none of them really feels like they have a specific focus or that they are that personal. Compare this to, for instance, YouTubers. YouTubers are laser focused on connecting with their audiences around very specific areas and very specific passions. And because of this, a YouTuber provides a much better platform for e-commerce outcomes because they are presenting people stories and content and products in a way that just connects with you in a much better way. So if you want to drive e-commerce revenue, you need to dramatically shift your traditional publishing model. You have to focus your efforts in a much more targeted way. And you have to put the spotlight on your journalist and you have to get them to use their expertise, their personal passions, their energy to drive people to be inspired by what they do. In other words, you have to become an influencer, not by scale, but through people. You can't just focus on scale and try to drive e-commerce sales via random articles. That just turns you into a supermarket, which also means your revenue potential will have a very low ceiling. If you truly want to break through and become the place that people turn to to learn about the latest products, you have to be an influencer and you have to think like an influencer and you have to bring your journalist out in front. The final thing I want to talk about is how to measure e-commerce effect. Now, obviously, as a publisher, you are going to measure your e-commerce success based on how much money you make from it, as in the total amount of revenue that you generate. But this is the natural thing to do. And as a publisher myself, I would measure that as well if I was doing e-commerce. But what is actually much more important is to measure it in terms of average order value per reader. Now, the reason for this is, again, that we see these two different levels of e-commerce performance. 
One is where e-commerce is merely driven by page views and exposure, and that you're making some money from doing listicle types of articles like 10 things that are good with pasta. This type of e-commerce will drive some level of revenue, but it also creates a very low average order value per reader because it's essentially just another form of advertising. So if you measure your e-commerce performance per reader, and you see that the revenue per reader is merely at the range of what you would usually get just from advertising, you know that you are in the low-end form of e-commerce performance. The other way is when we have a higher level type of e-commerce, where people come to you as a publisher because you are helping them achieve a goal, you're giving people real advice, you're doing comprehensive reviews, and your journalists are front and center and existent influencers and experts that people want to listen to. When you have this higher level type of e-commerce, you will also notice a much higher overall revenue potential. But the way we can measure this is by looking at the difference in the average order value per reader. So looking at your average order value per reader is a key metric for determining whether your e-commerce efforts are performing just like random ads or if you have achieved that higher level performance. And obviously, as a publisher, you want to get into that higher tier of e-commerce. You don't just want your e-commerce to perform like every other random ad. You want e-commerce to be something that is much, much better than advertising. So have your team look at average order value per reader and try to optimize for that instead of optimizing for total revenue. And what you will notice when you start to measure this is that there is a kind of a gap. The low end form of e-commerce will have a range that is somewhere like advertising. Then there will be a kind of a gap, a kind of a jump up to the higher level of e-commerce performance. And depending on what kind of publisher you are, that gap can be quite significant. Let me give you a simple example. Imagine that you're just doing affiliated links and you get this percentage of a percentage of a percentage kind of performance where a few people click on the article and then a few people click on the link and then a few people buy something. The outcome of that when measured by average order value per reader is going to be a fraction of a dollar per interaction. But then if you create these higher level of performance where you have created a really good article, very high editorial quality, very good advice about something that people actually need, the people who read that article are much more likely to go out and actually buy it. So suddenly you will have a conversion rate that is similar to that of regular web shops. And it's that kind of difference that you want to look for. So these five things I've now talked about are the things that you need to look for when you are defining your e-commerce strategy. Now, obviously, there are many more things that I could talk about, but one of the big challenges when we go into the specifics is that this is going to be different from each type of publication. So you need to look at what you do specifically and start to think about these elements in relation to just what you are doing. But I'll end this with this simple piece of advice. On the internet today, we already have all the products that we need. So don't be a place where you're just showing me random products that your e-commerce team found on Amazon today. That form of e-commerce has the lowest potential of all. Move yourself into that higher level of e-commerce where the product exists for an editorial reason. Remember, people come to you as a journalist because they want better insight than if they just visited Amazon. So don't be Amazon. Be a journalist. And with this, we come to the end of this podcast. I hope you liked it. I hope it was useful to you. And if you have any feedback, don't hesitate to contact me. Now, this podcast was a bit special because it actually links to a plus article that I'm working on, where I will talk about all these same issues, but I will go into a bit more detail about each one of them, as well as bringing you some of the more visual examples of what works and what doesn't work. So check out Beckel Plus. I plan to have that article out probably at the beginning of next week. But as always, thank you for listening.